stands for Jeep G, and I stand with them. I stand for justice and peace. I seek a society free from war and the threat of it, a society that accepts and respects diversity, protecting the rights and dignity of every person. The CEAP stands with me through their programs on conflict resolution, peer mediation, and peace education. I stand for ecological integrity, for respecting the environment as our common home and working together for its preservation and protection. The CEAP protects our common home with its programs in food security like organic farming, energy management, and the preservation of key ecosystems like the Save the Sierra Madre program. I stand for engaged citizenship, for working with my LGU to respond to the concrete problems and challenges of our communities. The CEAP works with my school to give more students opportunities to be good citizens. I participate in their Citizens Watch and Voters Education programs. I stand for poverty reduction, for improving the lives of our less fortunate brothers and sisters through programs that foster the fair distribution of wealth and promote the good of all. The CEAP helps me to do this with their feeding programs, livelihood programs, and disaster relief operations. I stand for gender equality, for the end of discrimination against women, for the integration of LGBT into society, and respect for all our brothers and sisters in Christ. The CEAP stands with me with our programs in young women leadership training and gender fair education. I stand for youth empowerment, for enabling the youth to act and lead with compassion, freedom, and responsibility. I stand with the CEAP, and you can too. Sakay na sa Jeepji. Talk to your regional Jeepji champion to see how you can help. Jeep-G, and I stand with them. I stand for justice and peace. I seek a society free from war and the threat of it, a society that accepts and respects diversity, protecting the rights and dignity of every person. The CEAP stands with me through their programs on conflict resolution, peer mediation, and peace education. I stand for ecological integrity, for respecting the environment as our common home and working together for its preservation and protection. The CEAP protects our common home with its programs in food security like organic farming, energy management, and the preservation of key ecosystems like the Save the Sierra Madre program. I stand for engaged citizenship, for working with my LGU to respond to the concrete problems and challenges of our communities. The CEAP works with my school to give more students opportunities to be good citizens. I participate in their Citizens Watch and Voters Education programs. I stand for poverty reduction, for improving the lives of our less fortunate brothers and sisters through programs that foster the fair distribution of wealth and promote the good of all. The CEAP helps me to do this with their feeding programs, livelihood programs, and disaster relief operations. I stand for gender equality, for the end of discrimination against women, for the integration of LGBT into society, and respect for all our brothers and sisters in Christ. The CEAP stands with me with our programs in young women leadership training and gender fair education. I stand for youth empowerment, for enabling the youth to act and lead with compassion, freedom, and responsibility. I stand with the CEAP, and you can too. Sakay na sa Jeep G. Talk to your regional Jeep G champion to see how you can help.
stands for Jeep G, and I stand with them. I stand for justice and peace. I seek a society free from war and the threat of it, a society that accepts and respects diversity, protecting the rights and dignity of every person. The CEAP stands with me through their programs on conflict resolution, peer mediation, and peace education. I stand for ecological integrity, for respecting the environment as our common home and working together for its preservation and protection. The CEAP protects our common home with its programs in food security like organic farming, energy management, and the preservation of key ecosystems like the Save the Shara Madra program. I stand for engaged citizenship, for working with my LGU to respond to the concrete problems and challenges of our communities. The CEAP works with my school to give more students opportunities to be good citizens. I participate in their Citizens Watch and Voters Education programs. I stand for poverty reduction, for improving the lives of our less fortunate brothers and sisters through programs that foster the fair distribution of wealth and promote the good of all. The CEAP helps me to do this with their feeding programs, livelihood programs, and disaster relief operations. I stand for gender equality, for the end of discrimination against women, for the integration of LGBT into society, and respect for all our brothers and sisters in Christ. The CEAP stands with me with our programs in young women leadership training and gender fair education. I stand for youth empowerment, for enabling the youth to act and lead with compassion, freedom, and responsibility. I stand with the CEAP, and you can too. Sakay na sa Jeep G. Talk to your regional Jeep G champion to see how you can help. Good morning, magandang umaga to all the administrators, faculty, and personnel of the SEAP member schools all over the Philippines. I am Reverend Ed Colmenares of the Society of Jesus, the Associate Director for Programs of Simbahang Lingkod ng Bayan or SLB, and I will be your moderator for this morning session. We welcome you all to Day 2, the second day of our 2022 SEAP National Jeep G Conference which is brought to you in partnership with the Private Education Assistance Committee, or PEA. But before we begin or we continue, let us begin our session with an opening prayer. As we remember, we are always in the presence of our Lord. And so we make the sign of our faith in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this opportunity to come together, albeit online. We thank you for the graces that you have given us during these past years as individuals, as communities, and as a nation. We continue to ask for the necessary graces as we move forward during these next few months leading up to a crucial moment in our history. 
continue to inflame in us, Lord, the desire to build up your kingdom here on earth through our choices, through our vocation as educators. This we ask through Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So once again, good morning and uh, magandang umaga. No? Uh, ayong buntag sa atong tanan. No? Uh, for those who just tuned in with us, we welcome you to day two of our GPG conference with today's session entitled, wait lang, mahaba-haba yung title, Elections in the Filipino Youth, the Challenge for Catholic Education Amidst Disinformation. Again, we are live both on the SEAP Facebook page and the SEAP channel on YouTube, also via our other uh, social media streaming partners. No? Before we begin, allow me to give you some reminders. First of all, as the talk is ongoing, we encourage you to post your questions or comments at the comment section on the Facebook and YouTube page of SEAP. We will ask these questions later or read the comments during the Q&A portion. Kung meron din kayong gustong ipabat or ipashout out, you can also force it through the comments section as well. Second, certificates. And it seems like we're getting a lot of questions about them. Please be informed that you will receive the certificate of attendance only upon completion of the evaluation form. The link has already been posted as part of the caption, both on YouTube and on Facebook. But please note that the link will only go live after this session. That means at around 8 o'clock, uh, 11 o'clock, and will be open only until 5 p.m. today. So if you click it now, it's not going to open yet, but just wait until the session ends. We encourage you to answer the evaluation form, and you will receive your certificate of attendance within three to five days. Lastly, please be reminded that this is a free webinar brought to you in partnership with the Private Education Assistance Committee. We are giving this free to all our partner member schools. No? But if you want to pay it forward, you may want to donate to the fund, the donation fund of SEAP, the Kapatirang Kamagong. It is our fund for helping the poor and struggling SEAP mission schools, especially during this time of pandemic. So later, we will be flashing the account details for those who wish to donate. No? And I think if you send in stars, uh, this, uh, that's, uh, where the, uh, that's the fund that will receive the donations. And lastly, we encourage you to share this webinar, uh, share this link on your uh, Facebook news feed or to your various groups with the hashtag, hashtag say up cares, hashtag I love Catholic ed, hashtag Say up, Jeep G. Ayon. Okay. So we have a long morning up ahead, but a long and interesting one. Let me now introduce our session. Alam naman nami natin, in less than two months, we will already be electing our next set of leaders who will be in power for the next three or six years, depending on the position. And as educators, I am quite sure we are concerned how we can shape this future together with the very young people who are entrusted to our care. We always hear the word or the phrase youth vote as a buzzword during these elections. But what does that really mean during this time? How can we better understand what this youth vote means and what that entails for us as Catholic educators? But also, given that we are aware of the massive disinformation we see around us, not just in social media, but even in traditional media. Some of us might be discouraged at what we see and what we hear on the ground. And yet, as educators, we are still challenged to combat this information. How can we help each other or even check on ourselves for it? Otherwise, of course, we run the risk of being instruments of such disinformation, which runs against the values of Catholic education. Alam ko po, these are very heavy and serious issues. But we will be spending time this morning to talk about these. No? At dahil bigatin ang usapan, may dalawang bigatin din tayong kasama who will walk us through these issues in the next few uh, minutes, in the, couple, in the next couple of hours. And so I'd like to introduce our first resource person for this morning. We have two. Our first research person this morning is a trustee of the Asian Center for Journalism at the Ateneo de Manila University. 
Currently, he is a columnist and editorial consultant at Grappler. Please help me welcome with a virtual applause veteran journalist, Mr. John Neri. Good morning. Thank you, Brother Ed. I'm very happy to finally take my first ride in the CAAP Jeep G. Um, I trust that I am in good hands. I've been asked to speak on elections in the Filipino youth, the challenge for Catholic education amidst disinformation. And I have about 25 to 30 minutes uh, for my presentation. So if you'll allow me, I'll get started. Yesterday, the February Pulse Asia survey uh, was released. I mean to say the results of the February uh, 2022 Pulse Asia survey were released. Uh, and some of the findings include This, this is table number 18. And voting age Filipinos were asked, who do you think has the greatest concern for the poor? And a plurality uh, said, the son of the dictator. Who do you think is the most honest and trustworthy of the presidential candidates? And a majority of voting age Filipinos represented by 2,400 survey respondents named Ferdinand Marcos Jr. And who do you think is the least corrupt? A large plurality of the survey respondents, again named Ferdinand Marcos Jr. We have Responsibility for those who are in our charge, the youth. What do the youth say? Here is another table from the most recent Pulse Asia. This was taken between February 18 and 23, so about a month ago. And the survey respondents were asked, who would you vote for among the 10 names on this list? And a great majority of the 18 to 24 age group, 71%, said they would vote for the son of the dictator. That accounts for 14% of the vote. 25 to 34 age group, which accounts for about one-fifth of all voters, 63% said they would vote for Ferdinand Marcos Jr. The same proportion, 63%, from the next age group, 35 to 44. Perhaps many of our teachers belong to this age group. And this age group also accounts for about a fifth of all voters in the Philippines. I am reminded of the CEAP vision, speaking of a world transformed and the Philippines renewed. Now, I'm, I'm sure older than most of you. I was already uh, an activist during the martial law years. So I speak from a generational perspective that you may not share, but when I see these findings, I wonder whether the world has been transformed, the Philippines has been renewed, even without our knowing so. In 2015, uh, in one of a series of columns I wrote, arguing that Marcos was the worst, um, I addressed 
a similar question. Why is it that some Filipinos seem ready to buy into the Marcos version of history? We went through uh, this moment in history. We know exactly what went on. Why do it seems many people seem to think that the Marcos years were the golden age for the Philippines? I identified five possible factors. First is the loss of perspective. It is very much a uh, moment in our history. It has receded into the past. And because it has receded into the past, it's rather difficult to understand it correctly. That's the first. The second, I think, um, perhaps because of our work, uh, is the most painful to admit. But our educational system has failed Filipinos. We have not done an adequate job in reminding the nation of the atrocities of the Marcos dictatorship. I found out uh, a few months ago, because my youngest uh, is now a college freshman, that in a conversation he had with other college freshmen, they realized that the Marcos years were taken up in their different schools in almost the exact same way. Either the Marcos years were described in terms of pros and cons, like it were just another administration, or it was just discussed in terms of pros. No cons at all. And I think that is a symptom of the failure of our educational system. There is, I think, a third factor at work. The relativism of protest, I said. Every single president since Cory Aquino has been denounced on the streets as a dictator. Uh, unfortunately, we have realized too late, that calling every single president a dictator cheapens the term, uh, weakens the preparation for when we actually meet a president with authoritarian tendencies like the current one, Rodrigo Duterte, and degrades the significance of the dictatorship of Ferdinand Marcos. There's a fourth factor, the power of myth. And my favorite example here is, look at the difference between 1995 and 2010. In 1995, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. ran for the Senate and lost. I think he placed 17th or 18th. He waited 15 years. And when he ran again in 2010, he won very comfortably. What happened in the intervening 15 years? Social media happened in those 15 years. You had uh, search media first uh, becoming dominant, uh, especially through Google. And then you had in 2004, Facebook, and then in 2006, uh, Twitter. Um, Google also very early on bought uh, YouTube and the Marcoses have been busy seeding YouTube and Facebook with their own myths about the Marcos years. The scholar Cheryl Ruth Soriano of De La Salle University, working with other scholars like Fatima Gao of the University of the Philippines, have found that there are just a handful of what they call aspirational tropes Uh, that we use to classify the pro-Marcos uh, disinformation content on YouTube. Uh, one of the aspirational truths, for instance, is the insistence that during the Marcos years, the Philippines was a genuine democracy. Democracy understood as uh, the exercise of our freedoms plus the imposition of discipline. A fifth uh, Factor is 
the lure of innocence. I could have used a much better phrase here. All I meant to say here was that the media has also failed us because the media, because of the nature of uh, the beast, uh, keeps running after new and newer and newer stories. Uh, we're always looking after the latest, the newest scandal. Uh, and as a result, uh, some of the worst scandals in our history um, have been neglected. Fast forward to 2022. I think I would like to add, if I were to update my column from 2015, at least three more factors. Why? If the Pulse Asia findings are accurate, do people buy into the Marcos myths? Aside from the power of myth, I think we need to understand that there is in fact an infrastructure of myth making. In another context, this is what the scholars Jonathan Corpus Ong and Jason Cabanes in their landmark, landmark uh, work of research, the architects of network disinformation call the invisible machine of disinformation. It's an actual infrastructure. It's not just, you know, People thinking, hey, it might be good to say this or that about the Marcuses. There is an actual structure for uh, fabricating and then circulating the myths. Very much related to this, and I think we can see this in what Jaime Marcos has been doing for the last several years, the culture of celebrity. Uh, for many people, the Marcuses are like the Kardashians. They are famous for being famous. It's the 3,000 pairs that Imelda Marcos left behind when they fled to the United States in 1986. It's just a remote moment in history. But the fact that Amy Marcos is on a sitcom or a uh, uh, TV drama um, is very much current. Um, I think Marcuses have realized that the most, most potent uh, weapon they have is turning themselves into celebrities. Last but certainly not least, under Duterte, we have had an almost official policy of rehabilitation of the Marcuses. Duterte has been uh, very frank, very candid about the debt of gratitude he owes to Amy Marcos for being one of three original provincial governors to support him. Uh, and out of that debt of gratitude, we have a supine Supreme Court ruling that the remains of the dictator uh, can be buried at the National Hero Cemetery. So we are face to face with information. Well, I would like us to agree on uh, a common language. We can use these terms interchangeably in the same way that we use quote unquote fake news all the time. But I would like to suggest that as educators, we can popularize this uh, language, this common language, um, first proposed by Claire Wardell and Hossein Derakshan. So misinformation is the sharing of false information where no harm was meant. It was accidental. For instance, a reporter getting the name of the victim or worse, the suspect wrong. Uh, and that comes out in the newspaper. That is misinformation. But there was no intent to uh, ruin the reputation of either victim or suspect. It was an accident. Let me jump to the third. Malinformation is the use of genuine information, but in the wrong and harmful and in a harmful context. So for instance, a medical diagnosis should only be shared among uh, loved ones, family members and uh, closest friends. To dox that, to share information like uh, your medical diagnosis or your credit card details, for instance, uh, in a public context is malinformation. It is the sharing of genuine information um, in another context in order to cause harm. That leaves us the middle term, which is our main problem. This information is 
deliberately false or fabricated information. That's the first of the two main elements. It is a deliberate act. It, it is not an accident. And it is knowingly shared to cause harm. It is deceitful. It is deceptive. It is, del it is deliberate and it is deceitful. Even among uh, my fellow journalists or even my own uh, fellow conveners in the Consortium on Democracy and Disinformation, we are not agreed on the use of the term fake news, uh, in part because Donald Trump has uh, appropriated that. And now people use it the way Donald Trump uses it as an act of dismissal. Fake news is anything that you do not like or do not agree with. Ah, that's fake news. But I propose that, in fact, there is a uh, useful uh, um, th there is a uh, instructive use rather for the term fake news. Uh, it can mean technically uh, a form of disinformation that is disguised as the news. So it's, it adds a third D to the two elements of disinformation. It is deliberate. It is deceptive and it is disguised as the news. Either it looks like it came from ABS-CBN or the URL uh, is made to look like it came from GMA. And in fact, it, something exactly like that happened to GMA uh, a few years ago. So I would like to submit that fake news can be used uh, technically uh, in that sense as a form of disinformation disguised as fake news. <laughs> I forgot that I left this in. So, you know, we might all be like Ariana Grande, uh, feeling an immense uh, sense of frustration. Uh, given all of this, uh, what, what can we do? I want to be very frank about the specific topic, uh, the elections. There is not much that we can do with less than 60 days to go. Let me rephrase that. There is not a lot that we can do, there is, but there is much that still needs to be done. In other words, not many, but much. For us, I think, as educators, we need to encourage our fellow teachers, our fellow administrators, and our students and their families to get out the vote. I think it is too late already to mount voter education campaigns. Uh, sure, some kind of voter education, however you define it, uh, may still take place, but I think the need of the moment, if you consider that the son of the dictator might very well become the next president of the Philippines and will preside in September at the 50th anniversary of the imposition of martial rule in the Philippines, I think that the stakes are clear. And our role is get out the vote, attend those rallies, get people to attend those rallies, go house to house. The odds are very long, but if I can offer one personal anecdote, we felt exactly the same way um, in February 1986. We knew that there were many supporters for Cory Aquino, but we also knew that Marcos was an exceedingly uh, brilliant tactician um, with the military uh, in his complete control. We had no illusions that Cory Aquino would win the 1986 snap election. A few days before, uh, I, I was uh, responsible for a uh, polling center very near Capaginaldo, the national headquarters of the Philippine, of the armed forces of the Philippines. Naturally, many of the residents uh, 
were affiliated with Camp Aguinaldo. I think, I think it was three days before the elections, we called for a meeting of poll watchers. Very few people showed up. And we realized that, well, this was to be expected. However, on February 7, the day of the snap election, when I reported to the polling center, we had more than uh, the number of volunteers we needed to serve as poll watchers. For some reason, people waited until the very last day to decide to show up. I don't know if the same thing will happen in uh, 50 plus days on May 9, but it's possible. But the focus is on getting out the vote. I think the second thing that we need to keep in mind is that we must prepare for a turbulent next few years. We must prepare to put up a resistance network. If in fact the surveys are right and Marcos will become the next president of the Philippines, are we just going to lie down and roll over? I think precisely because we are Catholic educators, we need to hark back to what Catholic educators did 30 years ago and again, do our part. There is a, a, a sociologist, a, a thinker by the name of Zeynep Tufeci, who wrote a book called uh, Twitter and Tear Gas, the, fragility of, uh, the Power and Fragility of Network Protest. Um, and one of the things I learned from uh, her research was the concept of network internalities. We are familiar with network externalities. A network becomes more valuable the more members there are to a network. If there are only two phones in the world, your phone cannot be too valuable. But if there are 5 billion phones, your phone becomes so much more valuable. Uh, but the idea of network internalities is we need to be able to work together in real life, uh, in real time, not just online, not just digitally, uh, to prepare for, for the worst. What will the Catholic Educational Association of the Philippi Catholic Education Association of the Philippines do if a President Marcos Jr. will cancel the February 25 EDSA People Power Revolution anniversary or repeal the law that declared August 21 as a holiday? We need to be ready. And I think getting out the vote now and in the next two months is part of the preparation. A lot of the work that lies ahead is for the long term. When we look at the findings and we see that a majority of people, 53%, think that Ferdinand Marcos Jr. is the most trustworthy, or that 41% of voting age Filipinos think he is the least corrupt. I think we must realize that our work, made more difficult by disinformation, uh, is long-term work. Which brings me to my last few slides. How do, I, how do we fight forward versus, dis, versus disinformation? I would like to offer this framework that uh, I have been using with my colleagues. It's our way of trying to understand all the things that are going on in what we call the disinformation ecosystem. I use here as an analogy, the communication loop that we are all familiar with. When someone sends a message, you have a sender, that's one element, sending the message, that's a second element, through a channel, that's the third element, uh, to a receiver, that's the fourth element. And when the receiver sends feedback, then the communication loop uh, is closed. I would like to uh, use this analogy, split channel uh, into two parts uh, to make way for social media but use this analogy in order to understand 
what it is that we are faced with and what it is that we can do long term. So, and I, at this point, I will ask for your indulgence. Uh, I have a weakness for alliteration. So I um, identified all five dimensions uh, uh, with the letter M. So the first dimension is the dimension of the messengers. You have, as uh, Jason Cabanas and Jonathan Corpus Ong pointed out, an invisible machine with three, three tiers. You have the architects, you have the influencers, and then you have the operators. And then also we have to consider that we have state actors. Uh, in February 20, 2018, our very first, I'm sorry, uh, our very first um, conference on democracy and misinformation started with a uh, video uh, produced by verifiers arguing that in the Philippines, the chief source of disinformation is President Duterte himself. What can the CEAP do? as far as the first dimension is concerned. Chances are that the architects, these are creatives uh, from boutique ad agencies or PR agencies who are the masterminds of disinformation campaigns. Chances are that these are alumni of our schools. Chances are also that the influencers that the invisible machine depends on defined in that research work as uh, influencers with uh, anywhere between 50,000 to 2 million followers. Chances are that these influencers too are our alumni. We need to engage these architects and these influencers in a continuing dialogue. We need to understand why they're doing this. As I've said, this information is not accidental. It is a deliberate act. It is an act of evil. We need to understand why our own alumni may be involved either as architects or as influencers. The third level would be operators. This would be people who are paid uh, either per day or per post or per week or per campaign. And of course, many of them uh, may also be alumni of our institutions. I think we also need to wrestle with the responsibility of the association itself to take the lead in holding institutions to account for disinformation. We shouldn't wait for crisis situations such as a make or break election to issue reminders about what we teach our students regarding witnessing to the truth. We need to take the lead today and in the next several years in holding institutions of government and institutions of society to account for fabricating or playing a role in distributing disinformation. The second dimension is the message. Now, I'm sure you... Uh, uh, understand the scale of the problem. Perhaps there are millions of discrete, uh, specific messages of disinformation uh, content spread every single day. How do we even uh, come to uh, grips with that? I would suggest that we think in terms, especially for an association like CEAP, we think in terms of disinformation themes because research has shown that all of these millions of pieces of disinformation content can actually be classified into just a handful of disinformation themes or deep stories or myths. So it is easier for us to be able to message check these disinformation themes. You remember uh, a couple of years ago, there was an attempt by Deputy Speaker Pulong Duterte to rename Ninoy Aquino International Airport. He wanted to rename it the Manila International Airport, not thinking the matter through because in fact, right now there are four international airports uh, in Manila. But what was the reason uh, for that attempt? Uh, 
it was meant to reinforce one of the disinformation themes that have been uh, uh, shared uh, heavily in the last uh, six, seven years. And that is EDSA is a failure. EDSA is a failure, which it, it traces its roots to the Nina Aquino assassination. Why honor uh, the, the martyr in the first place? So perhaps uh, CAP can uh, engage institutionally in message checking. Perhaps, I don't know, uh, an institute um, to, uh, or a center to fight back against this information can be put together uh, by CEAP member institutions. And one of the things that they can uh, focus on is message checking, helping us understand what are the deep stories or the aspirational tropes uh, that are being circulated, because that would be a uh, more effective way of combating this information. And related to this is uh, the possibility that CEAP can invest in counter myths. By myths here, I mean uh, larger truths. Uh, there, we have myths, for instance, in our national anthem that, for instance, we are all ready to die for our country, ang mamatay ng dahil sayo. Now, that will not be the case for every single Filipino, but that does not make it untrue. It is a myth in that sense. It is a larger truth. And I think we need to invest or rediscover those myths that will push back against the Marcos uh, deep stories or disinformation themes that have been seeded all these years. The third dimension uh, is the first half of the channel, uh, standard media, mainstream media. And I think the Catholic Education Association of the Philippines can provide institutional support for mainstream media. Uh, imagine what, just as an idea, pooling subscriptions together can do for those newspapers or newsletters or digital sites uh, that have been proven to uh, do original reporting and uh, speak truth to power. Or CAP, either as an association or through its member institutions, can partner on social media uh, with these mainstream uh, media institutions. There's another way in which the CAP, in which Catholic educators can help fight back against disinformation long-term. And that is to serve as resource persons for mainstream media, to actually serve as regular contributors, op-ed uh, writers, commentary writers, to help shape public discourse. The fourth dimension is the second half of the channel. Here I, I'm talking about digital and social media. Um, I think we all realize that YouTube, Facebook, and now TikTok are very influential, especially among the uh, students that we are responsible for. The sociologist Arnold uh, Alamon of MSU Iligan said something once in a forum uh, last December that uh, really struck me. And he said, um, YouTube is actually an epistemic community. It's where people learn things. And Facebook and TikTok is, uh, are the platforms where they share what they learned on YouTube. We need to be aware of these dynamics. And we need to uh, engage in critical collaboration with the platforms. I'm happy to say that Facebook is very open, has been open uh, to uh, critical collaboration in the last maybe three years. YouTube, not so much, that needs working on. But I'm almost certain that our alumni are working in Facebook, in TikTok, in Twitter, in YouTube. Maybe we can also reach out to them so that we can do systematic monitoring and raising of standards uh, in the work of the platforms. 
Another thing we can do that the Catholic, ed uh, Catholic educators can do is to develop an active presence on social and digital media. Um, we should not leave it only to, for instance, the Catholic uh, media network to be present on social media. Each of our schools must have its own presence and must have an, a, a proactive uh, participation in the shaping of discourse on social media. Last but not least is, and I apologize for the PILIT uh, M, uh, membership, the fifth uh, dimension, members of the audience. And this is where I personally am involved. We have just finished with the Private Education Assistance uh, Committee, a series of five regional uh, seminars uh, called Teachers versus Fake News, where we teach three modules in one day on critical reading, critical thinking, and most crucially, critical feeling. I think that uh, it is incumbent on Catholic educational institutions to invest in developing both the, their teachers and their students' critical faculties. How to read critically, how to do fact check, and then beyond that, how to read laterally so that we are able to make uh, better use of our time and our attention how to think critically, how to recognize the most common cognitive biases and uh, learning heuristics. And last but not least, how to think critically, how to raise our emotional intelligence so that we are not vulnerable uh, to uh, sophisticated disinformation uh, strategies that precisely appeal to our feelings and our emotions. So in a nutshell, this is the M5, the five dimensions of this information ecosystem. Uh, I realized that this is very different from perhaps what some of you may have been looking for today. What can still be done in the next 55 days? Um, like I've said, there's not much, there's not a lot that we can do, but there, but there is much to be done to get out the vote and to prepare uh, to put, put up networks of resistance. Um, but long-term, our responsibility is to actually disinfect this ecosystem. Uh, and there are five dimensions. We don't need to be present in all five. Uh, choose our core competences and be present in those dimensions where we can make an actual difference. Okay, I think I have just... Uh, uh, run a little over time. Uh, I will end uh, at, at this point and uh, uh, I'm just the curtain raiser. I'm very happy that uh, Dr. Jayil uh, is coming after me and then after that I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. John Neri, and thank you for unpacking the challenge for Catholic education, not just in the next few months, but really the next years. No? As we've seen also how our current situation right now has been in the works also for several years, uh, depending, regardless of which camp or which perspective you take on. No? Um, I Maybe we, before we go to our second speaker, uh, just a shout out to several of those who are watching us on our Facebook and YouTube live stream. A shout out to Ms. Uh, Gracious uh, Romero. Uh, she is one, I think, of the volunteers of SLB. Good morning also to SEAP. We have various uh, greetings all the way from the north, from La Union, from Baknotan, going all the way to the south no, in Ipil, Zamboanga City, and uh, even in, of course, Medyo malapit-lapit may nagpapabati dito from the Immaculate Conception Academy in Green Hills. Ayon. And currently, we also have uh, one of the... We have a viewer from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, Miss Virginia Kawaga. So once again, good morning or I think that's good evening for you there in Canada. And then also we have uh, also... Sister uh, Miria, uh, Samira Kalin, thank you so much, uh, Sir John Neri, for the information. Also, Eileen Makandog wishes thanks to Mr. John Neri and to 
Tayap and to Simbahang Lingkod for organizing this webinar this morning. Now, let us go to our next resource person this morning. He is a sociologist of religion at the Ateneo de Manila University where he holds the Oscar R. Ledesma Professorial Chair and also a fellow for, of the Institute for Studies in Asian Church and Culture. He is also the Director of the Development Studies Program. Please help me welcome with a virtual applause, Dr. J. Yil Cornelio. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's so difficult to come after Sir John Mary. You know, he really gave, he unpacked a lot of important things related to this information. Um, but I am just so pleased to be sharing my own insights with you. I am very thankful also to SEAP and SLB for this opportunity. I think these are, um, these are spaces, even though time is running out, these are still very important spaces. In fact, I, uh, I am aligned with Sir John Mary's argument, which we should not be only thinking, from what I, what I picked up from his lecture was, we should not only be thinking about the next two months. We should be thinking of the long durée, no? Ano yung ating magiging action? And I think that's a very big lesson, um, especially once we begin to understand uh, the situation of the Filipino youth today, especially in relation to politics and the elections. So that's what I'm going to talk about, the elections in the Filipino youth. I will be approaching this topic as a sociologist. I do a lot. My, my work is primarily on religion, but also on youth and generational change. I'll be sharing with you a lot of insights from my ongoing work. Some of them, uh, some of, them, uh, some of you might be familiar with uh, even. So elections and the Filipino youth. Let's begin with this quote. Sabi ni Comelec spokesperson James Jimenez in one of his open letters, and he loves doing that, right? I challenge you and your generation to lead the way forward so that the rest of us may follow. I have no doubt that you are up to the task. You have to be. An entire nation is depending on you. Sabi ni James Jimenez in one of his open letters addressed to young people. So what, what do we pick up from this, uh, from this statement? The burden is on young people today. The burden is on young people to really uh, lead uh, society. And, and is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Pwede natin pag-usapan yan along the way. Sabi niya, you have to be. An entire nation is depending on you. How did young people react? How, how do young people respond to such um, battle cries, if you will? This is a statement on your screen right now. Sabi to ni John Dale, um, who heads the... Uh, uh, National Union of Students in the, in the Philippines, si John Dale uh, Ropero, if I'm not mistaken, his first surname. Nagkasama kami in one webinar and, and uh, I saw that she wrote this as well. Sabi niya, as youths, which make up a substantial proportion of the voting population, we have a huge role to play in the upcoming election and that is to vote for comprehensive and competitive leaders. We have a huge role to play. So, so she's internalizing the challenge. No? So you have James Jimenez, an adult, telling young people today, the burden is yours. And you have a statement, you have um, a student leader like Jan Dale saying that, oh, we have a huge role. Agree, we have a huge role to play in the upcoming election. And that is to vote for comprehensive and competitive leaders. So, uh, so young people are taking this up, are, 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 are saying yes to the challenge. Many of us in the audience right now, I know that we are all educators here, primarily in Catholic schools. Some of us presumably are young, so we can still consider to be part of, of the youth demographic. But I, can, I believe that all of us are involved uh, in the affairs of young people, in educating them, in mentoring them, in helping them. And so I think itong nabasa natin dalawang statements from James Jimenez and from John Dale resonate with us. Yeah, youth vote, um, burden on the youth, uh, youth are idealistic, and they are going to lead our society. 
In other words, the dominant discourse that we're seeing and we're hearing all the time is that is this, the youth will save us. A sociologist ako. Sociologists are <laughs> party poopers, no? We're always, um, we always take things with a grain of salt. But sinabing yes ng isang tao, sociologists are trained, really? But sinabing no, uh, really? No, yun yung laging tanong ng mga sociologists. Um, it's the nature of the discipline, it's the nature of the beast, no? the discipline that is sociology. If everybody is happy, we, we don't accept that, no? So the question that I am posing is along those lines. Okay, the youth will save us. Yeah, I can understand. But how valid is this claim? May mga nabanggit na si Sir John in his powerful lecture just now. But I'll be reiterating some of them in a bit. But I'll be highlighting three things for you. The first one, the first one, statistics. Who are the registered youth? Gana sila kadami. Are they going to make a difference talaga? The youth voting patterns. I'm going to share with you youth voting patterns from the 2016 elections and and recent uh, observations that we have. No, papakita ko yun sa inyo. And dun makikita natin na parang actually the problem is not really short term. So that's why I, I echo Sir John Mary's um, long durée perspective. No, uh, preparing for for what might happen. You know, after the elections. Um, and then, titingnan din natin yung konsepto ng, or yung, yung, the phenomenon of the woke, the woke youth, you know, woke versus others, young people on social media, which I think is a very important topic in the light of our theme today, disinformation. So young people on social media. The youth will save us. How valid is this claim? Let's begin statistics. No 2016, there were about 55.7 million registered Voters. You see that on your screen now. Um, voter turnout was 78%. Mataas yun. Um, certainly higher than in many other Western countries where electoral uh, participation is generally low, which also goes to show how, uh, which also goes to them to, you know, which is a symptom of, of, of low trust in politicians, low trust in the elections, low trust in democracy and so forth. So I could 78%. So people still believed in the elections. At least 2016, we saw that. 43.7 million voter turnout. What's the picture like now? Dito, uh, sa bansa natin in 2022. Obviously, we have a bigger population. A, a lot of young people have uh, grown up. Uh, in fact, now we have 67 million registered voters, uh, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen. 5.4 million sa kanila ay first-time voters. Can they sway the elections? Of course they can, especially if it's a close fight. We saw that uh, in 2016. Close fight for the vice presidency. Young people, 18 to 30 years old, about 32.7 million of them. You know, So there are almost 50% voters, at least 18 to 30, depending on what, what you consider youth. No? Up to 40, you know, uh, and so it, it will certainly be a lot more than, than this figure. But if we focus on the 18 to 30 age bracket, that's what we get 32.7, and again, big enough to sway the elections to determine the outcome of the elections. Because of this demographic profile, many of us, ladies and gentlemen, are quite optimistic. Ah, yeah, of course, the youth will save us. Ah, of course, the youth should go out and vote. Of course, the youth should should do their thing and, and should really lead and show the way for the rest of us, as James Jimenez puts it. No? No? So for that, we need to take one step forward. Ano ba ang voting patterns ng mga kabataan? This is, how, this is going to be... Uh, many of you might already anticipate what the what it looks like, what their voting preferences look like. But anyway, let's see. Let's see. Back in 2019, uh, senatorial elections, I wrote this piece for Rappler. Um, I contribute on a monthly basis in the thought leader section. Um, whom exactly are the youth voting for? Okay, what did I do? I simply asked Paul Asia, can you disaggregate the uh, the senatorial preferences, the voting preferences for senator? according to age bracket. Bakit? Kasi napansin ko, and I'm very active on Twitter in particular, Facebook not so much, but Twitter, yes. 
And on Twitter, you really see ano to eh, the names are just, uh, um, if you rely on Twitter, you would feel na Chel Jokno is gonna win. At that time, Samira Gutok was part of the Otso Derecho. Um, all these really very progressive names, you know, refreshing names, if you will, um, would would win. Kasi nga, that's the that's the chamber that in, I inhabit on social media, and everybody seems to at the time everybody seemed to um, to expect these names to finally win. So I simply asked Paul's Asia, can you disaggregate? The, the the voting preferences according to age for me. What did I what did we, what did I see? This one. 18 to 24 and then 25 to 34. Left, right. Sino ang number one na ng 18 to 24 years old? Lito Lapi, Grace Poe, Bongo, Bong Revilla, Cincha Villar, Pimentel, Cayetano, De La Rosa, Angara, and you can go on and on. Napakalayo ni Marojas, napakalayo ni Aquino, um, Colmenares, ang layo. Uh, 25 to 34. Sinong number one na binoto ng generation na yan, ng cohort na yan, 25 to 34? Cincha Villar, Yutulapi, Cayetano, Po, Angara, Binay, Go, Bong Revilla, De La Rosa, uh, Marcos, ay ni ito. Ejercito, Estrada, again, ang layo ulit ni Aquino. Um, if you were rooting for him, Malayo sina Pimentel, uh, sina si Rojas, um, and Chel Jokno doesn't even show up here. No voting preferences. People, how do you feel about this? You know, now realizing that oh my goodness, young people in 2019 voted for these names. No, share with me your thoughts. No, in the comment section on Facebook, share with me um, how do you feel about this? And maybe later on in your questions and you know, or in your in the open forum, share with me, share with us, this Sir John. You know, how do you feel about this voting preferences? Again, 2019 ito. In 2016, folks, ha, at that time, hindi pa uso-uso yung Gen Z, no, millennials pa lang. Those who were born in the 1980s up to uh, the early 90s, mid-90s, yun yung traditional, conventional age bracket ng millennials. What happened? It turns out, according to an exit, the exit poll run by SWS, tignan nyo yung naka-highlight dyan na paragraph in the middle uh, on your screen. It turns out that among 18 to 24 year old voters, uh, so ito yung mga college students natin, di ba? Or mga fresh grads natin. There was a there was a 33 point lead kay Duterte in favor of Duterte against Mar Rojas. Tapos, among the 25 to 34 year old voters, the, the, the lead was 26 points, 26 percentage points. In other words, the younger the voter in 2016, the more the appeal of Duterte. So in other words, young people voted for Duterte. Again, I'm asking you, how, did you, how do you feel about this in retrospect that young people the students that we trained possibly uh, were in favor of, of, of the third thing. Again, snapshot of what happened in 2016. Fast forward, 2022. Pinakita nito ni Sir John just now. But again, it's worth highlighting. Uh, my next Rappler piece will talk about this, the youth vote. No? I'm going to analyze this uh, in comparison to other uh, Pulse Asia survey findings. No? Kitang kita nyo po, the younger may pattern, you know. Look at the look at the distribution of voting uh, preferences for Bongbong Marcos across across age. The younger the voter, the greater the probability of that person voting for Bongbong Marcos. The younger the voter, the higher the chances of voting for Bongbong Marcos. Compare eighteen to twenty four, dun sa sixty five and up. So older voters, obviously majority pa rin ang 55% no? for 65 years old. No? Uh, pero it's very telling that if you're 18 to 24, 71% of your cohort will vote for Bongbong Marcos if it were held today. Um, and if you're from the 55, you're uh, sorry, 65 years old. So senior citizen, so let's consider you know, 55 to 64 and then 65 and up. So seniors, almost seniors and then senior citizens. Lower, 54, 54. 5% of their respective cohorts. Tapos, so makikita niyo yung pattern kay Lenny Robredo, it's the reverse. It's the inverse. 
um, it's the older ones who will who are more likely to vote for her than are the young people. Again, proportionally speaking, ah, syempre, maliit pa rin ang 18% and 19% no, among 55 and 65 and up. Pero compare 19 and 18 doon sa 14 ng 18 to 24. Um, and then the rest, you know, we can analyze them separately later on. So the younger the voter, the more likely that that person is going to vote for Bongbong Marcos. Same pattern that we saw with young people, millennials, in 2016 who voted for the death. So malaki, malaki ang responsibility natin, especially if we really are, if we resist, no? if we resist the rise to power of the of the of the dictator's son. Paano po yung education? Let me show you this um, these findings from from Post Asia also released just just yesterday. Tignan yung po yung pattern among educational attainment. Ano po nakikita ninyo? For Bongbong Marcos, again, just a basic um, uh, surface uh, analysis of uh, of the voting pre preferences according to education. The more educated, yep, some of you might have seen that already. The more educated, the more likely that person is going to vote for Bongbong Marcos. Compare nyo po, no? 51% lang yung no formal education or elementary grad lang. Pero pagdating na some college, 72%. Post the, uh, yung mga nag-graduate nag school, 55%. Pero you see the pattern, it increases. In other words, what we're picking up is that more the more educated Filipinos are more likely to vote for Bongbong Marcos than are less educated Filipinos. Again, majority pa rin yung 51% no, among the formal education, um, no formal education or mga elementary grad na. Pero we see that the, path, the, the, the figure increases as education also, educational attainment also increases. Nakikita natin, it looks like mm, medyo ano, no, pero parang pa, pa UK, Kelenny, no? Uh, pero makikita ninyo, you have, um, you have uh, dis distributed si Lenny Robredo among the Um, the less educated and among the um, educated uh, with uh, in uh, tertiary schools, the tertiary institutions. No, hindi hindi discernible ang pattern. Kaya bang bang Marcos really discernible ang pattern. So again, again something for us to think about um, the, the, about about our role as educators. No, how do you feel about this? Okay, counting slides pa po and uh, we can. Uh, ano to? Um, we can have our open forum na. And again, share it with me. Your share with us your thoughts or maybe questions that you might have about about this fine. The last part of my presentation is this: social media, social media, disinformation, and so forth. Everything is happening on social media. As a social media, meron din din na the woke, no? Ito yung mga yung mga politically conscious, historically aware. Familiar dun sa economic data, no? Tawag sa kanila, the woke, no? And usually makikita mo naman yung pattern, yung mga woke would vote for, uh, for uh, back in 2019, the Ocho Derecho, and, and then now, ito yung mga nasa uh, for Lenny, and then the others seem to be the unwoke kasi sila daw yung mga nagsaspread ng disinformation. So the question is, will the woke save us among the youth? The answer is, well, let's unpack the word woke. What does it mean to begin with? Um, bakit ko tinatanong ito? Kasi uh, these woke um, individuals, figures, uh, social media accounts and actors are pretty active, no? Are pretty active and they're in fact celebrated. Look at this article celebrating the, some, of these, um, some of these big names, no? Sabi, Filipinos just needed a show to bring woke culture to Twitter by posting their political opinions in 280 characters for all the world to see. In the age of quote-unquote fake news, Sir John Yan, everyone will surely appreciate the presence of genuine watchdogs and keen observers like poet Juan Miguel Severo, column writer Irish Dizon, artist Shai Polisier, as well as Twitter users who handle the accounts Punong Bayan underscore, Joy Cabar, and Millennial of Manila. Sila kasi, if you're active on Twitter, you know what this article is talking about. 
these are they tend to share viral tweets um, about historical denialism about Bongo Marcos and there are many more no there are many many more uh, right now and collectively you might want to call them the woke no so so this article celebrates woke Twitter okay a problem lang as I have uh, as I have pointed out in this 2019 article in in my rapper piece the concept of woke also tends to to border on elitism. No, um, I'm woke. You're not woke. Um, I'm intelligent. You're not intelligent. Um, at one level, you may argue that um, it's only about being intelligent, being smart, being aware of social political issues. I know my history. You don't. So you better listen to me. So there's that, no? talking down on, on other Twitter accounts you know, who spread fake news as if um, correcting fake news is the only way that we could um, improve the conversations. You know? Unfortunately, what is happening is that, um, and, and we need to be sensitive uh, uh, to this reality as well, is that many of the political divide, if I may put it mildly, the political divide um, on social media is really drawn, you know, among um, between people who are perceived to be elitist, no? Perceived to be, oh, kayo na yung maraming alam, kayo na yung matalino, no? Kami na lang yung bobo, no? And and if you analyze that. The, those discourses closely, you realize that there is also a moral tone there. So it's not just about knowing my facts, be, and you therefore have to know your facts, because uh, you're entitled to your opinion, but, um, but you're, you're not entitled to your own facts. Without us realizing that the political divide is also moral, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. There is also more, or at the very least, it's more, or or maybe moralistic. Kaya something for us to think about, no, to 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 critically reflect on, my brothers and sisters, as I end my my lecture. Um, um, are we inviting young people from the opposite camp in a way that welcomes them into the conversation, or are we inviting them? And then once they become part of our conversations, we talk down on them. No? Um, so we need to be very careful uh, with, the way, um, we, with the way we deploy facts. Fact checking can only work so far. You know? um, so it's a very important realization. We can talk about it in our open forum later on. Um, the important point that I am making here is that it tends to be elitist. Look at what the, the great philosopher Daniel Padilla has to say on this matter. Bakit daw hindi aktibo si Daniel Padilla sa social media? Because he recognizes exactly that same problem. Sabi niya, maraming tao, tao na naninirahan na realidad nila ay social media. Yan po ang kanyang sagot. And I think Daniel Padilla is so way ahead of all of us, you know, with this philosophical realization in life. Um, uh, a big, you know, a big uh, uh, realization for many of us, I suppose. So, bilang pagtatapos po. What do we have here? Number one, there is no one youth vote. Huh? There's no one youth vote. Um, being woke is a double-edged sword. Yeah, you know your facts. But the moment you deploy it on other people, it can be elitist. And, and if we are also honest about... Um, about the current political situation, many of those people who resist uh, the Liberal Party, many of those who resist the Dilawan, but we're all branded Dilawan, even though we really are not, it's because of the elitism that, um, that they sense from us. No? So yeah, socially conscious, but elitist. So may ganong classing element. Um, some of my colleagues in the psychology department and Ateneo are also echoing exactly that uh, that observation in their own findings, in their own research on social media. 
uh, political attitudes on social media. Finally, we need to ask this question. To whom are we referring when we say Filipino youth? Sino po ba? Market. Education, class, employment, regionalism, they all divide us. There's no such thing as the youth vote precisely because the youth to begin with are fragmented. As you see on your screen now, we need to recognize this reality if we wish to harness the potential of the youth in shaping contemporary politics. Hmm, Jayil, what do you mean by that? We need to recognize this reality if we wish to harness the potential of the youth in shaping contemporary politics. I think there are two ways to address this. Um, and let me pack, uh, conceptualize this in terms of intergenerational justice. No? Um, on the one hand, we recognize, no, we recognize that the youth are fragmented. Um, so while there are highly educated youth, there are also young people who are not educated. When they, can they come together? Are there spaces for these different young people to come together and talk about issues that affect their generation? Um, everything, no? uh, history, economics, politics, um, specific issues, divorce, gender equality, uh, taxation, and so forth. No? Because these issues affect different segments of our young people differently. That's one way of looking at intergenerational justice. Within this particular generation, are we, talk, are we thinking about the future together? Do we have spaces like, like that? Most of the time, we don't. Eh? I say our schools tend to be homogeneous. Upper class, middle class, privileged, affluent, English speaking, and so forth. But there's also another way of looking at intergenerational justice. Intergenerational justice as, as conversations between generations. No? Kanina di ba, I began with this, uh, uh, this, this uh, battle cry that the youth will save us, that young people are going to save our nation and they're going to lead us and show us the way. Passionate, correct. Inspiring, correct. But from the point of view of intergenerational justice, it might be too much to place the burden on young people alone. Adults also have to be held responsible for their for the mistakes that they have committed, quote unquote. And young people and adults could come together in a conversation and have deep discussions about issues that affect the nation. I feel that this is the kind of conversations that we need to encourage. Whether at the dining table, families, whether in our own classroom, teachers, different, all teachers and all our students coming together, talking about issues. Hindi lang the teacher as the source of knowledge. Uh, in our respective parishes or church communities, um, the elderly or the adults coming together in a fellowship with young people in our parishes, talking about issues. Hindi voter education, uh, let me tell you, uh, what principles you need to internalize and think about before you vote in there, but the conversation. What issues affect you? What issues affect my generation? Let's come together and what's the best way forward? It cannot happen overnight because these are conversations. Conversations that it takes generations to develop. And that's a question that I'm asking all of us today. It's a question that I keep asking myself um, all the time. As an educator, can Catholic education make a difference so that instead of only thinking about the next 60 days, we're also thinking about the generations before us and the generations ahead of us? Why am I saying this? Precisely because, as we have argued with Jason Cabanas in the Duterte Reader, trolls, disinformation are very successful precisely because they're simply echo the public sentiments of young people or the public sentiments of people. Yung sama ng loob nila sa gobyerno, yung sama ng loob nila sa sistema, yung sama ng loob nila sa traffic, yung sama ng loob nila sa mga nangyayari around them. So all trolls have to do is to simply listen to the ground 
and then create a narrative. That's the sociological explanation why trolls abound on social media, why fake news abounds on social media. If you really think about it very closely, the desire for the glorious old days, the imagined glorious old days of the past, Ferdinand Marcos and Marshall Law, we know that's not true. Economic data disproved that. We know that, right? But the fact that there is that fantasy did not happen overnight. You know, that, that narrative did not, um, was not born over, did not develop overnight. It was years and years of disillusionment among people who feel na parang, hmm, how come life hasn't really improved? In other words, there is a sociological reality that accounts for the rise of this information. And I feel na fact-checking is not enough to correct all of that. Conversations, intergenerational conversations will go a long way in helping us realize um, um, and, and arrive at the best ways forward. So yan po, if you're interested in um, understanding the fragmentations of our youth, I'm sharing with you this book that I edited in 2020 together. Um, and there are 17 authors here, scholar contributors about the, the situation of young people around the Philippines and why it's, it's not correct to treat young people as a monolithic whole. Exactly what I shared with you today, but, but uh, articulated in different ways in this book. So I'll end there. Maraming maraming salamat po sa pagkakataon to share, with, uh, to share these findings with you. And I hope that we will have a productive um, open forum with Sir John. Maraming salamat. The coming national and local elections is an opportunity to exercise our Catholic Christian call to social responsibility and love of country. It is happening at a time when our country confronts unprecedented crisis of enormous proportions, with millions of our kababayans suffering from the health, economic, and psychological impacts of the pandemic and the devastation of Typhoon Udet. People are afraid of what the uncertain future holds. We are struggling between hope and despair, even toward the leaders we are electing three months from now. We, the undersigned members of the National Board of Trustees of the Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines, a national network of private Catholic schools, colleges, universities and seminaries in all regions of the country believe that our Christian values should be proclaimed vigorously in these elections. These values are at the core of our mission of teaching, research, community engagement, and spiritual formation. We value truth and thus we deplore the massive disinformation that is deceiving our people, especially our youth, in a way that is unparalleled in our history. We vehemently reject the candidates who run under this platform of lies and historical distortion disseminated in social media by massively financed trolls, particularly the brazen presentation of the Marcos dictatorship and martial law as benevolent regimes in our political history. We denounce candidates who exploit our people's poverty through vote buying and intimidation. We value justice and thus we reject candidates who have supported the unjust acts of the current administration, particularly its drug war that has killed thousands, mostly poor and powerless, and the blatant lack of remorse and accountability from the country's top leaders. We reject candidates who supported the current administration's policy toward China's aggression 
inside Philippine territory. Its rejection of the Hague ruling and the lack of protection of Filipino fisher folk. We value democracy. Thus, we support candidates who uphold it and the rule of law in our land. We reject candidates who undermine democracy through intolerance of critique and opposition, influence peddling in all three branches of the government, perpetuation of a culture of impunity, traditional and patronage politics, and through rampant human rights violations. We value integrity and thus we support candidates with the following qualities. No record of corruption, proven competence in participatory governance, transparency and accountability in public service, love for the poor and their empowerment, ability to sacrifice for the sake of the common good, and readiness to fight for the values of truth, social justice, and democracy. We support leaders who wield power as social responsibility and not self-entitlement, and who can connect to the spiritual in their lives through their conscience, discernment, and faith in God. We value our work of educating the youth, and thus we support candidates who will uphold, push, and support legislation to strengthen private education and recognize its complementarity with public education as critical in nation building. As educators, we humbly pursue our mission to be beacons of light, to bring the light of truth, justice, democracy, and integrity to our society now languishing in the darkness of lies, injustice, authoritarianism, and dysfunctional leadership and governance. The May elections is the opportunity that will break this darkness. Ultimately, the choice is moral, leading us to take prophetic, non-neutral, even partisan positions on behalf of the gospel values we stand for, discerned prayerfully and critically, and acted on with courage and faith. We call on our member schools, communities, and partners to unite in this great moral imperative of our times. Once again, good morning and welcome back to our day two of the 2022 National GG Conference. Let me just read some comments from our viewers on our live feed, both on YouTube and on Facebook. Some greetings, no? Uh, Father June Estoque uh, is uh, tuning in uh, this uh, morning. So uh, good morning, uh, Father June. No? I think he is one of the core members of the Christian Formation Cluster, if I am not mistaken. Um, also, we have more greeters, no, mga pabate, uh, from all those who are watching us. Uh, we have some Sister Ellen Casas Panes from the St. Lawrence Parochial School in Capiz, and also from St. Jude Parish School in Cavite, Joms Mongkal is greeting us. Uh, some of our viewers' no, comments are saying uh, thank you so much to what you have shared, uh, Sir Neri and Dr. Cornelio. Greetings from Celestina Bangkoleng and Eileen Makandog. Now, at this point, uh, we now go to the pinaka aabangang portion of this morning's um, webinar conference. Our Q and A portion. Now we may we welcome back to the screens, uh, Mr. John Neri and Dr. J. L. Cornelio. No? So. Once again, uh, thank you, Sir John and Doc Jail, for gracing us with your presence this morning. I'd like to start first with one interesting comment slash uh, parang question na rin, no? Although I think the input already uh, of both uh, Sir John and Doc Jail already pointed this out. No? Uh, according to Emily Alvarez, oh no, I feel so sad. Uh, it seems we really failed to educate our students well in terms of 
discernment and recognizing what is good and right. This is something that we should take seriously in the academe. No? What else can we do in the next few months or even years to actually help discern and influence our choices? No? Uh, so uh, it's not so much a, a question. Actually, it's really more a comment. I think the inputs already kind of answer also no? uh, what we can do in the coming weeks. Uh, what struck me with uh, one of the initial inputs, uh, especially from Sir John Neri, is how we've sanitized our history in our textbooks. Uh, I remember during my, when I was still in high school, not so long ago, uh, uh, my first year history teacher, this was the time when Philippine history was still in high school. Hindi pa na revamp with a K-12 program. And I remember my Philippine history teacher at that time, you were using a classical history textbook. I won't name the author or the historian. Basta pula yung cover with address Bonifacio uh, in front. No? I think you know who that is. And interestingly, my uh, history teacher skipped the chapter of Ferdinand, of the Marcos presidency in that book. Because he knew that uh, it didn't really highlight the atrocities of the Marcos period. And so I guess he did his research well. He decided to use the chapter from another book that also showed to us first-year high school students right now. Uh, maybe my question is here, how can, considering also the revamp that has happened in our history curriculum, uh, how can we introduce the atrocities of martial law, especially to a younger audience. Because if I'm not mistaken, in the new K-12 curriculum, Philippine history is now in grades 6 or grade 5. So, uh, Sir John, Doc JL, maybe you have any thoughts, uh, initial ideas on that? Thank you, uh, Brother Ed. Uh, age before... Uh, youth, <laughs> uh, Dr. Jails, so I'll, I'll, maybe I can go first. Um, I think that uh, this is a long-term uh, initiative, but what we need to do is to treat the Marcus years as not just another political administration. I think that the problem is that we've treated Marcos as though he were just any other president. We should treat the Marcos years the way we treat the Japanese occupation. Uh, it is an aberration in our history. Um, we can ask, what did the Japanese do right? But only as a matter of historical curiosity, as a matter of research. But today, very actively, you have young people asking, wait a minute, maybe Marcos did something right. You know, all those thousands of kilometers of roads, all those hundreds of bridges and so on. So when it is understood in that wrong context, I can understand what happens. He is just another president. In fact, we should treat the Marcus years differently as an aberration uh, in our history, just like the Japanese occupation. I think that would be... Um, a way to get started. But as I've said, this is going to, and as uh, Dr. J has already pointed out, this is going to take a long time. We will need to re-educate maybe an entire uh, generation. It's not up for us, uh, up to us anymore uh, to be able to, to do this. Um, in another forum I was in, I raised the possibility that perhaps at an earlier time, we could have passed what in Germany uh, in other countries uh, are called memory laws. Uh, you know, you, you, cannot, uh, um, you cannot deny the atrocities of Hitler uh, in Germany. That would be a crime, an actual crime punishable uh, by law. But as uh, someone else pointed out in that forum, it's already too late. Uh, so it's not up to us anymore to be able to uh, change this. Um, it, it, it's up to... Uh, the younger generation of scholars uh, like Dr. Jail and uh, his students to set things right. Pugan ko yung sinabi ni Sir John, uh, Brother Ed, if that's okay. 
from the point of view of sociology, the question you're asking, Brother Ed, is really about collective memory. You cannot learn collective memory only in the classroom. Collective memory is collective. Um, every opportunity that we can use to teach one another, again, we're focused on young people, ano? but in reality, I'm very sure, Brother Ed, marami mga teachers, loyalists. Marami mga teachers, historical denialists. Baka pati tayo, kailangan din natin ma-refresh ang ating collective memory. Concretely, what does that mean? Taking advantage of every um, opportunity possible. One day, magkakaroon ulit tayo ng mga field trips. Isama natin sa field trips yung mga important sites under martial law. Kaya po, <laughs> Plaza Miranda, right? Um, uh, uh, Edsa Shrine, uh, yung monument, yung yung bantayog, um, everything that 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 uh, 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 sa naiya and think and ask your students why it was called Ninoy Aquino and was renamed Ninoy Aquino International Airport. Spaces, kasi are also and we can be very Catholic in this way, di ba? Sacramental, di ba? Mm. <laughs> very, uh, they teach us the grace of God, also the lessons of, uh, of history. Documentaries, given, pwede natin gamitin yun. But ako sa akin, ang napaka-useful, di ba Sir John, the Japanese occupation, malayo na siya sa atin kasi maraming patay na sila. May natitira pa, pero I mean, they're almost, di ba? We're, we're losing that generation, right? Uh, pero, pero marami pang buhay from martial law. Let's invite them. Tell their life stories. No, ikaw, Sir John, nako, I, I can't wait to really listen to you and your stories and how you fought you know, against the martial law. And it, it will never bore me. Life stories. Pwede natin isama yun, mga kapatid, doon sa tinasabi ko kanina na intergenerational conversations. Pwede yun eh. Parang, ano po yung pinagdaanan ninyo ng panahon na yun? Um, NPA po ba kayo? Kaya kayo ganoon? Kasi sinasabi po nila sa social media, um, wala naman po dapat na ikatakot kung wala ka namang uh, it, um, violations. Eh. Eh, yung mga pinahirapan lang naman ng Marcos ay yung mga NPA lang daw. So totoo po ba? Ganun po ba? And then if you hear it directly from a person who was jailed, who was not NPA obviously, it will change the narrative completely. Eh. Kasi history is so alive. It's still, it's still so real to us. Let's take advantage of every opportunity there is to rebuild this collective memory. Ninakaw ito sa atin ng mga Marcos from the 1990s until sa paglibing kay Ferdinand Marcos sa libingan ng mga bayani. Pero hindi nangangahulugan tapos ng isulat ng kasaysayan. Nagkatungkulan tayong buhay ng kasaysayan. Hindi lang para sa kabataan, hindi para sa atin. Thank you, Sir John. Thank you, Doc JL, for that. No? Napakaganda, napaka Parang, parang hindi ko gusto sabihin napakaganda but that's a very uh, uh, impressive metaphor no na parang yung pagnanakaw na ginawa ng mga Marcos hindi lamang sa kabanang bayan pero pati yung ating kasaysayan di ba uh, willing they're they're more than willing to whitewash certain things to water down the atrocities or even to silence those voices and i think it's good that we create more spaces for dialogue not just in the classroom, but outside. Kasi ako minsan nisip ko, with, especially when you mentioned about teachers, uh, I have students who complain to me about their other teachers before and currently, na pag nakita nila, nag-share ng fake news, uh, yung kanilang teacher, di ba? And that's still part of that space of engagement where collective memory is formed. No? And I find it striking that uh, while uh, Doc Jail and Sir John were we're reminding us of our task as Catholic educators to speak of truth to power. Uh, Dr. Loretta Castro, former president of Miriam College and one of our GG champions, also commented, as Catholic educators, we cannot be neutral in that sense. We can start by discussing the SEAP statement with our students, but also I think even with our neighborhood, with our community, with our colleagues. No? We should always be guided by our Christian values. Let us not hesitate to express our thinking. But of course, we cannot impose. Sharing our views will help in their formation, but also that willingness to listen. And I think this ties back to something I found interesting 
they resonate with with what Dr. JL said. Just he uh, he put the proper jargon for it. So, parang intergenerational justice. Uh, and really even just the kind of verbs that we use when we wish to talk about youth empowerment or youth engagement. Mas maganda yung, uh, at, at talagang totohanin natin that we walk with the youth. We listen uh, to them in building up the future. Don't just, yun nga, uh, put the bird, pass the burden on them. No? Uh, dinidem ko na kasi based doon sa slides ni Doc JL, hindi na ako pumasok doon sa definition niya ng uh, youth. No? But I guess maybe this is more anecdotal rather than uh, sound research. I know you've been to a lot of forums or you've also been engaged in a lot of groups that try to foster uh, this dialogue. Uh, may, and I'm sure some of our educators are willing to also listen here. What has worked so far in fostering this or creating these spaces where that intergenerational dialogue can happen, where people both young and old and those somewhere in the middle can just share what they know uh, and learn actually from each other. Uh, especially, I, I say this kasi ang, lalo na ngayon, parang napaka-polarized ng ating bansa. No? Uh, because, because of social media, I guess, but also the massive uh, disinformation or malinformation that we encounter. Um, whoever wants to go first, Doc JL, Sir John, what has worked so far in your engagements with young people or not so young people in trying to just foster this exchange and dialogue. Maybe Doc Jail can go first. Sige po. Sige po. So, sa akin po, it doesn't have to be programmatic, Brother Ed. Our young people are everywhere. <laughs> and napansin ko ito in my own church community. Um, we're, we're now allowed to go back and see one another physically. And we talk about these things. Um, and it's just amazing na yung conversation, syempre, mas matanda na ako sa kanila and, you know, I have the benefit of of, uh, of having grown up or maybe a curse of having grown up post-1986, no? And, uh, and, uh, and, and many of them were born in the late 1990s or early 2000s. So, yung ganong klaseng conversations, eh, um, na organic, I think, sa akin, ang nothing beats organic conversations. If you can have those conversations at the dining table, please do so. Please do so. But please avoid being moralistic about it. Please avoid being elitist about it because you will only create walls uh, with one another. Um, dining table, reunions. Medyo tricky lang po ang mga reunions no, kapag napaparty tayo kasi magkakaroon niya ng parang eh, dilawan ka kasi eh, kaya ka bias. No? Ay, si Sir John, taga-rappler yan. Wala yan, hindi yan credible. No? So yung pag nagari reunion, and ako, I always get accused of that no? kasi I rhyme for rappler. <laughs> and um, uh, medyo challenging lang yun, pero I hope that that our example, you know, patience and really understanding and listening to one another can, can foster organic conversations. Pero syempre, we can also be programmatic. Sa akin po, gamitin natin yung mga classrooms. May I invite our teachers, spend one day, pause, no? Pause, spend one day, drop all your uh, lessons for the day. Uh, pause, today, pag-usapan lang natin. Uh, the rise of bongbong monitors. Ano po yung mga opinion niyo? Pag-usapan lang natin. Yeah. No judgments, ganun. Uh, makita lang ng mga bata na pwede silang mag-express ng mga thoughts nila, ng mga ideas nila without being judged. And if they end up, you know, deciding to vote for Bongbong Marcos still in the end, um, nasa sa kanila na yun. But we've done our part, no? We've done our part. So let me end there. Baka si Sir John meron pwede sabihin. No, I, I, I like uh, Doc Jail's point about organic uh, conversations. Uh, I, I, I've seen that you know just uh, listening is uh, listening itself is just is, is already a superpower. Uh, I think it opens up many things. Uh, some people just want to be heard. I think and so I think uh, on that level, uh, listening uh, is, is a skill that we need to, uh, to 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 develop in ourselves and to in, uh, encourage in others. At the same time, I realize that there are many. There, there's a lot of pushback against uh, experts and so on. 
but there is also I've, I've also seen uh, that uh, the right kind of expert can make a real difference. Uh, for instance, uh, in history, uh, Shao Chua, I've worked with him. Uh, he he he, he uh, delivered this terrific lecture on democracy and disinformation that I thought was was one of the two best speeches I heard last year. The other one was Maria Ressa's Nobel uh, acceptance speech. Uh, Shao Chua really is able to connect on a, on, a, on, 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 a, on a fundamental level with very young people. So I think we need to look for experts like him. Uh, I don't want to embarrass uh, Dr. Jail, but uh, Jail is exactly that kind of uh, expert also. Uh, the, 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 the scholarly rigor is there, but he's able to meet people where they are. And I think, I think we need to celebrate that. There's also a person, I forget her full name, but uh, she, she, she's on TikTok and she does... Um, uh, mm. like little Simona, yeah, that's right, yeah. I mean, and somehow it works. Um, and, and she, you know, she gets a lot of traction on, on, on TikTok, and wow. So, I think we also need to look for these uh shiny examples. There aren't that many, so we need to learn from their uh example and also to, you know, maybe help develop uh other such experts. I think that would be. Maybe just one last thing. Uh, I'm really curious and also curious to know uh, Dr. Jail's uh, perspective on this as a, as a sociologist. Um, I'm curious to know about the role that fandoms uh, might play uh, going forward. Uh, I, I realize that even like, a, or especially a large fandom like BTS, there would be different groups, but you can also see that uh, you know, they work together on certain things. I, I, one of the things I've noticed about the younger generation is that they are ecologically conscious. I mean, this is the most environmentally aware generation uh, ever. And, and when you, so it doesn't have to be political, when you connect uh, an issue like that, that they're so, that they identify with and integrate that into the fandoms. I mean, I can just imagine some of the, some of the, the impact that, that can make so that one is a matter of curiosity to me uh, as a K drama fan. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I see the I see the potential of these uh, fandom, but I, I I want to see what happens. I think that's an interesting uh, question, Dr. Jail, to consider, especially how a lot of our youth are part of those fandoms, no? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that could work. That could work, Sir John. Although research also shows that the political socialization of a youth, of a child, really begins and is, in fact, even formed to a great extent in the household. Mm -hmm. If the parents tend to be apathetic, forget it. The children will grow up to be apathetic. No, or or or. Um, so there's that too. Eh? Your political socialization within the household. So. So while um, I feel now when we bring in um, celebrities and it's nice to, to bring them in and obviously these candidates are already doing that, no, it's just to, um, to, to, um, to uh, arouse interest, diba? Para to, to, just to show, you know, just to demonstrate that you know, the, the force is growing, no? the, the power is there. But I think political consciousness, political socialization takes a much longer process. Um, um, and I feel that I think celebrities can play a bigger role by reimagining their uh, contributions to, so to society. People are already doing this. It must be Angel Luxine, for example, right? Um, uh, uh, they're very brave, you know, in, in, in making commentaries on this, uh, losing, of course, uh, their own fans, pero but they're using their voice, you know, to talk about uh, big issues like this. Uh, yeah, but political socialization, right in the family. Brother Ed. Okay, thank you so much, Doc Jail. No, ang ganda. Uh, buti binanggit mo na yung mga celebrities. I was also going to ask about that. But I think at this point we are now at ten fifty. We have ten minutes left. Again, we thank uh, Sir John Neri and Doc Jail for 
uh, joining us this morning. Maybe some final uh, words from uh, Sir John and Doc J. Yil, mga uh, last minute uh, pa ba on, no? to our uh, attendees on Facebook and say, yeah, but madalas alam naman natin mas etong mga pa ba on yung mas naaalala kesa sa yung actual na input, di ba? So no pressure, but uh, hey. some last minute uh, pa ba on from Sir John and Doc J. Yil. Yes, uh, let's give the let uh, the young man the last word. So <laughs> let me go first, uh, Dr. Yu. <laughs> um, when Dr. Yu raised the uh, the concept of collective memory, I was really struck because I do think that uh, memory is very much a part of our sense of identity, and I think that is exactly what is at stake today and in the next generation. We are fighting for the identity of the Filipino. What does it mean now if we elect Ferdinand Marcos Jr. as president 50 years after his father imposed martial rule? Uh, what does that imply about Filipino character? And um, I, I am reminded. I am reminded that in uh, for me maybe the uh, the turning point was 2015. In January 2015, the largest crowd ever assembled to greet the Pope gathered in the Philippines. And in January, we were just ecstatic, right? Uh, the Pope uh, had the highest popularity rating of a single individual in Philippine history. And then in November of that same year, you had Rodrigo Duterte, curse the Pope. It was part of his shtick. And if you unpack that story, you will realize that it's a made up story. Uh, if it were true that he did not know the Pope was in town, he would have been the only Filipino adult not to know that the Pope was visiting in January 2015. But anyway, uh, he said he came from a hotel room with a woman and he came out and he got stuck in traffic and he said, what's happening? And so the Pope is here, and then he cursed the Pope, all right? Now, to be fair to us as a people, <laughs> there was an immediate impact on his survey ratings. It was the first of only three times in the last six years that his survey ratings went down. In fact, his ratings went down in December to such an extent that he started making noises, his people started making noises about maybe we need to go to the Vatican and apologize in person. I don't know if you remember that, but I do because I was covering the elections. In January, his survey ratings went up again and out went the window, out the window went all this talk about apologizing to the Pope. My point is that in that same year, 2015, uh, I guess the... The, what is the what was the word the uh, the euphoria of the pope's visit lasted until the end of the year but by 2016 we, we had forgotten and we had forgiven duterte uh, the next time uh, his rating went down was when uh, kian de los santos was killed and then the last time was when he uh, cursed the god of the catholics um I think that we, what we've, we've been seeing in these last few years is a struggle for what it means to be Filipino. And unfortunately, that struggle continues because it seems that he had only raised the curtains for the return of the Marcoses. So those of us who fought the Marcoses are thinking, wow, what does this mean? So I think I, uh, my, my only point here is I really like the idea of us engaging in a massive and intergenerational effort to rebuild our collective memory and to ask ourselves, what does it mean, in fact, to be Filipino? I will end on that note. Thank you. Thank you, Sir John. Dr. J. Yil. As a good Christian, I will leave you with a message of hope. No, Sir John, you know. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, everyone, this is not the time to give up. No social, in the history of social movements around the world, we know 
that social movements always begin with the minority. Political change always begins with the minority. Why? Because that minority knows. That minority is determined. And every time they, they're persecuted, they know how to fight back. This is the story of our faith, Christianity, but this is also the story of our democracy. So as the people of God in the context of our community today, we draw inspiration from our faith. It's a faith that says we don't give up because resurrection, death is not the end. Resurrection is the story that we live by, the lesson that we live by. And so in this sense, I am still hopeful about our, our society. We may have tried to bury our identity using the words of Sir John. They may have tried to bury um, our history and our collective memory, our consciousness. But the fact of the matter remains. We are still here. The remnant is still here. And we have a big responsibility to play a prophetic role. The prophetic role, sometimes offensive, sometimes inviting, sometimes encouraging, sometimes rebuking. Whatever we are, whatever it might be, you know, whatever role it might be, whatever responsibility it might be, I think the bigger task remains the same. And to not give up. To not give up. So please, um, kung nangihina po kayo, isipin nyo po, andito pa tayo. Andito pa si Brother Ed. <laughs> andito pa si John, si Sir John. Andito pa tayo lahat. Uh, we're, we're in this together and, 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 and truth shall prevail. I will end there and hopefully we will inspire the next generation to also push back and fight. Maraming salamat po. Maraming salamat, Dr. J. No? Those are very inspiring words from our resource persons this morning, uh, Sir John, Dr. J. Hill, that while we only have a few months left uh, before elections, we can still do something, but the task is not just only up until May 9. We know very well that in the next few years as Catholic educators, we are also challenged to combat uh, the massive uh, revisionism, massive stealing of our collective memory, distortion of it, but also to facilitate uh, spaces where different groups of people from all generations, from different uh, educational attainments, social uh, economic status can come together and just talk and allow ourselves to really be shaped by the truth of our history as we move forward also as a nation, no? Uh, again, uh, tulad ng palagi din namin sinasabi sa simbahang lingkod ng bayan, being an engaged citizen and a Christian is not just about casting your ballots on election day. It is a lifelong work. Uh, alam kong nakakapagod, but sana hindi tayo manghina in the next few years. No? Uh, before we end, may I just remind you again that we will receive, for our, for the, our viewers on Facebook and YouTube, you will receive the certificate of attendance only upon completion of the evaluation form. The link is already posted in the comments section of the page and will remain open until 5 p.m. today. Hanggang 5 p.m. lang po. Office hours po yata yan kasi ng sayab, no? We encourage you to answer the evaluation form and you will receive the certificate of attendance in the next three to five days. Also, the PowerPoint slides for all our sessions of the GPG conference will be made available at the SEAP website, seap.org.ph, uh, and ready for downloading. So the materials of the past days are all there, and we will also upload the ones we use today. Again, we would like to thank our guest speakers and also our web host, Raxo City, and of course, the Private Education Assistance Com Committee, or PEAC, for being such wonderful partners for this National Jeep G Conference 2022. Join us again tomorrow for day three on our session on good governance, justice, and peace. But also we would like to invite uh, you to join us this Friday, March 18, 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. as we have our ongoing Kwentuhang Halalan series uh, in partnership with Simbahang Lingkod ng Bayan and Radyo Katipunan. We will be featuring guests from Central Luzon and from Cagayan Valley for another episode of Kwentuhang Halalan, Conversations about the Elections. It will be aired on Radyo Katipunan 87.5 and will be cross-posted on SEAP and SLB's Facebook page. And another invitation, dahil usapang halalan po tayo ngayon, 
on March 25 at 6 p.m., CBCP and JESCOM will be hosting the Usapang Halalan, the CBCP Election Forum. It will be in the Ateneo de Manila University Hyundai Hall in Aritibat. For those who cannot uh, attend physically, it will also be live streamed on JESCOM, Radio Katipunan, CBCP's Facebook pages, and several other social media partners. On behalf of the SEA President, Sister Marisa Viri of the Religious of the Virgin Mary, and the SEA Board of Trustees, Mr. Jose Alan Arellano, the SEA Executive Director and the National Secretariat, this has been Reverend Ed Colmenares of Simbahang Lincoln ng Bayan. We thank our resource persons this morning and all of you who are present uh, for our conference. Thank you and good morning. For our closing prayer, we will pray the CBCP prayer for elections. Prayer for the elections. Let us pray that the forthcoming national and local elections may truly reflect the will of the Lord who guides the destinies of nations. For every petition, let us pray together, Deliver us, Lord. Deliver us, Lord. From coercion, intimidation, violence, and terrorism, Deliver us, Lord. From dishonesty, lies, and all distortion of truth, Deliver us, Lord. From bribery, graft, and all conspiracy for fraud. Deliver us, Lord. From gullibility to the deceptive and blindness of perspective. Deliver us, Lord. From threats, intimidation, and perverse language. Deliver us, Lord. Let us pray together. Hear us, Lord. Hear us, Lord. That conscience may always be our ultimate norm. Hear us, Lord. That the common good may always be our highest goal. Hear us, Lord. That human dignity may be respected all the time. Hear us, Lord. That the poor and the weak may always have the priority. Hear us, Lord. That care for creation may never be ignored. Hear us, Lord. That solidarity may guide the path of peace and development. Hear us, Lord. That genuine fear of God and love of neighbors may guide those who seek public office. Hear us, Lord. Let us pray. Shepherd of souls and Savior of the nations, Politics is your gift to us. A call to serve others and grow in holiness. Guide our politics as you guide our lives. May our political engagement for voters and candidates bring glory to your loving name. And help us grow in holiness forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Oh, wow.
Yeah. 